This episode is brought to you by Audible. Start the timer. I've got like 20 minutes tops to cover socialism, communism, corporatism, fascism, Nazism, the Great Depression, German politics under the Weimar Republic, the Third Reich, and of course, Hitler. So we genuinely have no time to spare. This video won't cover every aspect of the Nazi regime, that'd be impossible, but rather make a pretty limited argument with as much evidence as I can fit in this video. That argument is that the Nazis were not socialists. Let's jump in. There's a good chance you've heard that the Nazis were socialists. They were not. But that hasn't stopped Crowder from saying it before, nor does it stop Shapiro, and D'Souza even got to say it on PragerU. And as much as that would make it seem like this take is limited to online dweebs, real life dweebs are just as guilty. Somehow, this take has made its way to Congress, it's National Socialist German Workers Party, and the EU Parliament, where this happened. That Nazis were national socialists. It's a strain of socialism. So let's not, let's not pretend it's- As you just heard in that clip, usually the argument for calling the Nazis socialists boils down to, well, it's in their name. Nazi is short for this, which in English translates to this. And because it says socialist right there, this is supposedly enough proof that the Nazis were socialists and that therefore socialism is evil. It's a take on par with running to a public bathroom and snacking on that little blue puck because it has cake in its name. But there's a lot wrong with this take, and it starts with the problem of definition. Conservatives don't know, or more likely, purposefully obscure what socialism is since that allows them to use the term for anything they want. Usually, to equate it with the most destructive political regime the world has ever seen. So, let's actually define socialism. Socialism is a society in which the means of production are held in common. Lots of jargon there, so let's clear it up. Under capitalism, our current economic model, the means of production are held in private. Factories, businesses, and all the other industries that produce things and services of value for society are owned by individuals or a small handful of individuals. We call these people capitalists. Thanks to this ownership over the means of production, which from now on I'll just call private property, capitalists get a lot of privileges, namely profit, and have a large degree of authority. They are not elected to their role or representative of society in any meaningful way. Capitalists just own stuff, and that means they can make any number of decisions concerning work, have a privileged social status, and can heavily influence politics without much accountability. At the end of the day, the only thing capitalists are accountable to is profit, and making more of it than their competitors. If capitalists so choose, they can make more profit by slashing wages, extending working hours, or worsening working conditions, and they're just allowed to. The people who work for them, basically everybody else on planet Earth, are usually only able to resist these decisions up to a point. If workers don't agree with the decisions their employers make, it's not like they can elect a new boss or make the decisions themselves. In the balance of power, capitalists are clearly on top. So if workers refuse to carry out their boss's decisions, they run the risk of getting fired, with all the horrible consequences that can bring. Ultimately then, the choice offered up by capitalism is either you agree with your boss, the unelected figure whose primary objective is getting more money, often at your expense, or you suffer the consequences. To pay for shelter, food, and healthcare, you need to agree to the term set by at least one capitalist and sign a job contract. There is no other option. And wouldn't you know it, there's a whole channel dedicated to the various awful consequences of this economic model. Socialism radically opposes this fundamental characteristic of capitalism. Under socialism, individual ownership is substituted by collective ownership. In other words, workers own and operate the factories, businesses, and so on themselves. It's like a union on steroids. Decisions are not made by random individuals with capital trying to get more of it, but rather through democratic institutions guided by the concrete goals of improving people's lives not simply making the number bigger and assuming the two things go together. In practice, collective ownership can take many forms, like a centrally planned economy, a network of freely associated communes, a system of co-ops, a mix of these things, or even a whole different set of things entirely. There's no one universally agreed upon answer to how this system should be organized, and it's one of the biggest things socialists talk about. One thing is very clear though, 
and it's that the economy should not be run with two separate classes of owners and workers. The class system should be abolished entirely, and the decisions society makes around work and production should not be guided by profit, but by democracy. Socialism is, at its very basic level, nothing more than this. Either the means of production are owned privately, and it's capitalism, or they are owned collectively, and it's socialism. Honestly, I just went really fast, so if you want a video dedicated to the definition of these terms, here's a good one I like to recommend. There, that wasn't so bad, right? With this definition, we now have a test. To figure out if the Nazis were socialists, we can examine their discourse and their actions, and determine if they supported socialist causes, resisted capitalism and sought to abolish private property, or, on the contrary, if they supported capitalism. But first, the obvious stuff. One of the first things Nazis did when Hitler took office as German Chancellor was get rid of the socialists. Using as a pretext a fire in the German parliament, Hitler triggered a state of emergency and kicked into high gear his repressive politics against both Jewish people and communists. Members of the Communist Party were tracked down and imprisoned by Nazi police. The party itself was functionally outlawed, removed from parliament, and its members were pushed into either exile or prison. In fact, the sudden boom in prison populations from targeting the communists led to the creation of some of the first concentration camps, filled with socialists before becoming one of the major sites of the Jewish genocide. Soon enough, this repression of political opponents would go beyond the communists and extend further right to the Social Democratic Party. In the end, both parties that represented labor in the German parliament, whether revolutionary or reformist, were cut out of the political process entirely. All this was part of Hitler and the Nazis' plan against so-called Judeo-Bolshevism, the name of the conspiracy theory which claimed that socialism was nothing more than a Jewish plot to undermine so-called ethnic German society. To complete this effort, Hitler also cracked down on organized labor. Union leaders and prominent members were hunted down in much the same way the communist politicians were, and were beaten, killed, and imprisoned en masse by Nazi stormtroopers. All trade unions were first occupied, then banned, except for the German labor front, a union created and functionally controlled by the Nazi party. Collective bargaining and strikes were gone, and all that was left of the labor movement was the puppet union the Nazi party had set up, which failed even the most basic function of a labor union by bringing employees and employers under the same roof. The whole purpose of labor unions is to be a force of opposition to capitalist authority. Making the two share an institution effectively kills any leverage that workers have. And this was, of course, the point. On top of all this, the deaths and the destruction, the GLF's leader was appointed by the Nazi party, not by union members. And therefore, the organization heavily tipped the scale towards capitalists. In just a few short months, the Nazis had destroyed labor militancy altogether. But that's not all. You might remember that the Nazis were famous for their book burnings. Unsurprisingly, these same anti-socialist politics were obvious there too. Many of the authors whose books were burned were central figures in socialist politics, like Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Vladimir Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, Leon Trotsky, and many others. A conscious effort was made by the Nazi party and their sympathizers to destroy socialist literature because, generally speaking, the Nazis were desperate to destroy just about every outlet for socialist politics. All told, these measures are why that famous poem starts with the line, first they came for the communists. That is just what the Nazis did. They crushed the parties that championed socialist politics, the books that legitimized these politics analytically, and the labor movements that brought these politics into the world by giving workers power. But all these events have been brushed under the rug or presented by conservatives as nothing more than socialist infighting, based on… evidence? Which it clearly wasn't. Socialists are usually not too keen on burning Marx's books or hunting down labor union leaders. And as a little bonus proof of this divide between socialists and Nazis, neither the Nazis nor the socialists ever considered themselves or each other to be part of the same political family, something they made very clear by their seats in the German parliament. But since this last point is only a little stronger than the it's in their name argument, let's go back to the more concrete stuff. The Nazis were both a tool of German capitalists and promoters of the capitalist economy. It's not simply that they crushed labor power and leftist politicians, 
they actively furthered the interest of capitalists at a time where capitalism was in a bit of a troubled spot, to put it mildly. The first thing we can look at to make these arguments is the institutional support from capitalists that the Nazis received. In short, quite a lot. German industrialists helped promote Hitler's rise to power in every way they could. Capitalists from some of Germany's largest economic sectors invested millions of Reichsmarks, upwards of $30 million today, to prevent the Nazi party from succumbing to its financial difficulties and to help the party win elections. And to bolster their financial support with symbolic pressure, industry leaders also wrote and co-signed a letter sent to Hindenburg, then president of Germany, imploring him to appoint Hitler as chancellor to quell quote-unquote class antagonisms. In other words, large capitalists wanted Hitler's leadership to deal with the rise of socialism. Whether this support was decisive in Hitler's victory is up for debate. But what is undeniable is that it proves the close relationship between the two camps. And this relationship served a purpose. The Great Depression, the economic burden of the Treaty of Versailles, and the various bourgeois governments that ruled Germany under the Weimar Republic prompted more and more Germans to look for an alternative to capitalism. Specifically, they turned to socialism. Between 1928 and 1932, for example, the Communist Party more than doubled its membership. People were turning to the left en masse and at an unprecedented pace. The Communist Party was still a parliamentary minority, to be sure, but industrialists feared that these trends would continue and that socialism would come to end their monopoly over the means of production. What's more, German workers had recently won the right to unionize and secured the eight-hour workday and unemployment insurance. No one knew how far these trends would go, and capitalists couldn't afford to find out. It is in this context that the Nazis and industrialists found common ground, with the industrialists hoping the more authoritarian character of the fascist platform would be used to quell labor, and the Nazis hoping to use the industrialists' funds to conquer power and enact their reactionary, anti-Semitic program. Okay, so far we have two strong pieces of evidence for the capitalist character of the Nazis. The political repression of labor parties and unions, and the institutional support of the capitalist class. That's pretty good, but we can do even better by looking at what the German economy was like during Nazi rule, and how it differed from the economy of other capitalist nations and socialism. Nazis were big on privatization, the process of taking publicly owned companies and services and handing them over to capitalists. To quote a paper on the topic, it is a fact that the government of the Nazi party sold off public ownership in several state-owned firms in the mid-1930s. These firms belong to a wide range of sectors. Steel, mining, banking, local public utilities, shipyards, ship lines, railways, etc. In addition, the delivery of some public services that were produced by the government prior to the 1930s, especially social and labor-related services, was transferred to the private sector. In doing so, they went against the mainstream trends in the Western capitalist countries, none of which systematically reprivatized firms during the 1930s. The Nazis were unique in their commitment to privatize, and the economic landscape that resulted from this process, and Nazi rule more generally, ended up being a particular variant of capitalism. The Nazis ensured that capitalist ownership would continue under their rule, and even encouraged it with the privatizations process, free market principles still applied to large sectors of the economy, and organized labor was out of the picture, but the Nazis retained the ability to guide economic production when it suited their needs, usually to promote imperialist or wartime goals. This is not unusual. Even the US took the reins on production during the war. But this will often get brought up as an argument that the Nazis were somehow socialists, despite clearly expanding the privatization process and balancing that with the necessity to organize the war. To summarize then, more privatization, some state direction, no labor resistance, and plenty of capitalists. What results is an economy that could only be called socialism if your definition of socialism never addressed the question of private property. In other words, the most basic concern of socialist politics. And if you believe that all socialism is, is when the government does stuff. A grossly misguided definition of socialism that would make every society on earth, for almost all of human civilization, socialist. Nazi Germany was capitalist, and the Nazis made sure of that. Of course, while this whole video has been making a strong case for the Nazis were not socialist argument, it's important to note a few slightly more valid counterarguments, and why they don't ultimately change this conclusion. For starters, like all political parties, the Nazis had internal divisions, 
And it's true that some of the party's notable early members had anti-capitalist motivations, and even disagreed with the general pro-capitalist direction of the party and Hitler himself. However, the reason this fact is not ultimately damning to our greater argument is that these anti-capitalist Nazis were still fiercely and primordially nationalistic and racist, and therefore in contradiction with the internationalist and egalitarian ideals baked into socialist politics. But perhaps more convincing than a theoretical inconsistency is the fact that these anti-capitalist Nazis all became irrelevant to the Nazi project almost immediately. The few which even existed in the first place were either convinced by Hitler to abandon these anti-capitalist positions, as was the case for Goebbels, or were killed in the Night of Long Knives, early on in the Nazi party's rule. If the Nazi party ever had a trace of socialist politics, it was gone by the time it mattered, and the party freely embraced the preservation of a capitalist economy once in power. Secondly, this video started with a long and frankly boring definition of socialism for a reason. I did this on purpose because although Hitler had the word socialism in the name of his party, he also made every effort to distance this word from its original definition, a trick which we continue to see used today to try and associate the Nazis with socialist politics. Hitler wanted nothing to do with the actual definition of socialism, the abolishing of private property, so he made sure the word would only ever mean something else to his audience, whether that was by calling real socialism a Jewish conspiracy, captured in the phrases Judeo-Bolshevism and Jewish Marxism, or to redefine the word into some vague form of nationalism, like in the passages I'm putting up on screen. Hitler was intent on socialism becoming a hollow vessel for his politics, a marketing tool that he could use to trigger mass appeal and play up nationalist sentiments without ever delivering socialist politics. Finally, there are plenty of other things I wish this video could have touched on. The writings of Mussolini on the nature of fascism and the anti-communist belief that animated it, some quotes on screen right now, the social Darwinism of fascist ideology that legitimized capitalist hierarchy and made a socialist economy antithetical to fascist projects, the reactionary patriarchal, anti-Semitic, and homophobic beliefs that inform Nazi politics, and plenty of claims made by the right about the Nazis that completely misrepresent Nazi rule. But with only 20 minutes and a schedule of one video a week, this is pretty much as far as I can go with this massive topic. As always, sources are in the description. If you found this video enlightening, send it to a friend or family member who might benefit from it. This is one of those topics that gets covered very badly on TV and by various right-wing personalities, so I hope I've been able to clear it up a bit. I try my best to learn and understand as much as I can so I can share with others, and one way I like to do that is by listening to audiobooks. I travel a lot for work so I have plenty of time to sit on planes and listen to fascinating audiobooks on Audible. One great one that pairs well with this week's video is Michael Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds. It's a brilliant examination of how fascism and capitalism go hand in hand, and how corporate power subverts democracy. If you like to learn as much as I do, getting to pick a free audiobook every month is pretty nice. I don't think I can accurately convey how much I love Audible. I struggle to sit down and read a book, but with Audible, I can get through all the titles I've wanted to, all while running errands, or commuting, or traveling for work. It's completely changed how I learn. If you enjoyed this week's video, I highly recommend you check out Black Shirts and Reds on Audible. It's a fantastic listen. So if you'd like to help support my channel so I can produce more content like this, visit audible.com slash secondthought, or text secondthought, one word, to 500, 500 Sign up today and get your first month absolutely free. It really does help support me and my channel. Get started by following the link below, or by texting second thought to 500, 500 If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous content by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.